Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to talk about Gestalt, how it relates to symmetry and architecture. Now I want to say in this video, um, I'm sort of putting things together. It's not as well researched or even defined as some of my other content, even this uh, stuff about beauty. But I find it interesting. It's stuff I'm working on. It's stuff I'm playing with. So I thought I'd make a video, see what everyone thought. Um, and you'll see the connection to how it relies to symmetry, which is why I'm putting it out there. And I think it can it can be useful. Is, it, is it all these ideas I'm about to present complete? Maybe not. But that doesn't mean they're not extraordinarily useful when it comes to sort of designing architecture. So um, the the theory, the Gestalt, if you don't know what it is, is Gestalt is basically the way when people see or perceive things, when humans perceive things, they don't necessarily see the world as is, their their brain is making a lot of interpretations about what they see. And, you know, there's great examples out there. Well, you know, when, when you see this shape, there's no white triangle there, but we sort of perceive a white triangle on top of black circles and a black triangle. Of course, it's just little angles and Pac-Man shapes all around. That's Gestalt. We, it's not really there. Our mind puts that white triangle there, right? Um, you know, figure ground is another Gestalt thing. Do you see the, the goblet in the center or do you see two people's faces? Pretty much everyone can see them both, but you can't see them simultaneously. And one of my sort of favorite ones is this one, which is um, this can be perceived as both an old woman or a young woman. Um, so sometimes you can, most people can see both, but sometimes they have trouble seeing it unless it's pointed out. So really quick, if you're looking at the old woman, this is the old woman's nose. This is the mouth, the eyes. You sort of see a half face. And then um, this is the hair and sort of a head covering for the old one. For the young woman, she's actually turned almost backwards. And this is her chin line right here. And this is her ear and this is her nose. Um, so that's the young woman. So again, it's all the same drawing, but it's how the human mind perceives it. And so you can see lots of other examples through here. That a lot of black and white illusions are what they are, but you see things like circles and thing, things of that nature. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I'm just going to jump here for an interesting story. I have a son who's rather young, but in kindergarten, um, he had to color in I forget what it was exactly, but something like all the triangles had to be blue and all the rectangles had to be red, let's say. And if it wasn't a triangle or a rectangle, you didn't color it in a, at all. And um, actually, there was a shape much like this here, not necessarily the Pac-Man, but just this sort of little angles like this. And um, he colored it in. And I knew, I mean, I sort of knew Gestalt-ish principles. And I talked to him about, about it somewhat, like, is it a triangle or is it not? My opinion is... Either way, if you colored it in, it is a triangle because you perceive it as one, even though it formally isn't. But if your mind says it is, then sure, it counts as a triangle. Um, or, you know what, if you're being rigid to the rules, the lines don't connect, maybe it's not a triangle. Uh, he did get it marked wrong. He, he passed kindergarten, fortunately, but uh, he still got it wrong. I, I would have personally get graded it correct in either case. It, well, I guess it would have been wrong if it were a rectangle, but if you said it wasn't a triangle, perfectly right. And if you said it was a triangle, perfectly right, right? So anyway, as designers, you should be able to um, know how per perception in the mind happens and then leverage it when needed, right? And so again, I think a lot of this can come down to symmetry, which is why I want to talk about it now. And here I've got a, a figure here in white, the background. I've This is a SketchUp file. Um, I'm just showing you the drawing field and I've got this shape here, this form here, and it looks like a house. That's what it's intended to be. And of course it's symmetrical because that's the point. It's reflection symmetrical. That's what I wanted to talk about. And if you look at this, I think most people say, yes, that's a house. I see the form, right? And this is a, a bit of a cheat here, perhaps of an illusion, but I'm just going to pan around three dimensionally for this object because actually this isn't one house. It isn't one shape at all. It's actually two forms that are sitting next to, you, to each other, they aren't even touching each other. And you'll notice intentionally like each form is an asymmetrical shape in whole, but of course composited together. When I go back to this form, they, they are a symmetrical shape. And so one of 
my realizations from Gestalt is that things that are symmetrical or of good form, sometimes it's put, but I think a good form tends to be mere symmetrical because we're so used to seeing symmetry. That's how people look. That's how lots of animals and plants are sort of very symmetrical in that form. When we see things that are symmetrical, we tend to see it as one. So yeah, I've done the writing lighting in such a way that it sort of hides the shadow and all these things to sort of trick it and we don't see the lines on there. Um, but just its form, it reads as one, even if it's not, right? So that's, a, that's the base idea. Similarly, I could show, say, this object here. I'll zoom in a little bit. And if I asked anyone, hey, how many shapes are there? They'd probably say two. They might say two houses, right? Maybe these are they're, they're two twins or something. They're touching each other. They might see that. Similarly, if I, if I asked anybody, could you trace the shapes or could you trace, if I said there were two shapes here, what two shapes would they be? And gave any, if I gave anyone a marker, they'd say, okay, there's one. And here's the other. And right there is the line between the two. Pretty much everyone would say that. Of course, if I went three-dimensional, three not a surprise. In this case, they are indeed one. They're one shape, okay? And so from, from a point of Gestalt, I'm using the concept of symmetry. The reason why we see this is two, there, there's several reasons that I'm playing up with, but I think a primary reason is one is that this, if we imply a line here, this is a symmetrical shape from here to here. Similarly, from here to here, there's another symmetrical shape. So our line almost intuits a line, uh, or our mind almost intuits a line right there between the two shapes. And we see these as indeed two objects. Now, obviously, this one's shorter and this one's taller, and that certainly helps as well. But I could I could come in here, like the way I have this set up, um, and move this all down to being the same height, and even if I did that and I said, hey, how many shapes are there? Could you could you outline the two shapes for me? Everyone would still do it. The height doesn't matter. The fact that the, these two shapes are symmetrical allow people to see that as the dividing line between the two. So and this, this is going to get confusing a bit with the next slide, sort of. I'm going to try to use my words as best. I think that's pretty obvious. Like you can use symmetry to define a whole. I'm going to call it a whole. Like this is a whole and this is a whole. Of course, the whole thing, the whole shape is also symmetrical in itself, it's a little more complex. And so you read it as a unit. You can, when there's symmetry or good form, you read it as an individual unit. Okay, what I'm about to say now is I'm going to show something asymmetrical here, just zoomed over in the window. So here's this shape. I can pan around. You can sort of see oh, there's some, some other demonstrations I have there off to the side. Try not to show those. But you can see the shape. It's, it's asymmetrical. And this also looks like a unit, right? And so this is where it sort of gets confusing. When you're dealing with asymmetrical shapes, they also can feel as a whole. Now, it's sort of weird because I just said symmetrical shapes feel as a whole and asymmetrical shapes feel like a whole. The, and that is true when you're dealing with one unit. But also, symmetrical shapes can be broken down. Like the last model we saw that two symmetrical objects, could, even though they were one shape, feels like two pieces. You know, related to this form, that shape actually came from this shape, from two rectangles in, inside of each other. And look, at, I can say that two rectangles this is almost an identical form to the last one. I just haven't, but yeah, everyone can read this as two shapes because rectangles themselves are symmetrical. Right? And so because this is a symmetrical unit, we can read this as a whole or maybe a, a complete piece of, of the whole. Like this is a thing. It's symmetrical. It's a symmetrical. It's a thing. This also is symmetrical. It's a thing. Now, again, I'm using Gestalt principles to a certain degree to call this symmetrical. Yeah, if I were to pan over here, that rectangle becomes symmetrical. Right? If I sort of show the side, like that's a, that's a rectangle here. But, but on this side... It's just sort of like those triangles I was showing. We don't see the complete rectangle here, but our mind knows it's there, even if it wasn't there. If I magically erase the stuff back here, not magically, I could do it. I could make a model where this rectangle wasn't complete back there in that corner. But and if I showed it, it wouldn't matter. You would still read it as a complete rectangle. It's like that white triangle on top of the the, the black triangle in the Pac-Man. You, you read it as a whole shape. You read this as a rectangle, you know what the good form is supposed to be. And so this symmetrical shape becomes one unit. This becomes a unit. Of course, when they're touching, they look like a different form, but you can read them as individual forms, where the asymmetrical form only reads as, as whole, as a whole sort of unit. 
right? So um, the way you might use sort of this principle is um, when you want to do things. So let's say uh, your built different building types might want different references to holes in pieces or not. So something like, let's say a museum, a museum is usually composed of several small galleries, right? But yet from the, from the outside of a museum, it's one institution. You want to read holistic in that sense, like this is the museum, right? And so using an asymmetrical shape really makes sense for something like this. And you, I think that's why you see a lot of asymmetrical, um, and I'm going to, I'm loosely using the term asymmetrical, you know how I sort of get about using that term if you've watched other videos. Um, but a lot of museums tend to be more asymmetrical because they, they create a wholeness to the whole building with unemphasizing the smaller pieces of it. Something else, maybe things like a church could be the same way. You know, I don't think many churches deal deal with this, but I can imagine like, hey, you want to be a whole community as a church. So you might want to be like an asymmetrical piece if that's what you're trying to get across. Of course, older churches and cathedrals and stuff, that wasn't their point as making unity. That was like, I am the priest. I am special. I go here. Right. And so you might use a different form under that. I'm just coming up with some ideas here. That said, there might be times where you might want to do something like this, where yes, you're a whole, but maybe you want to emphasize the individual pieces. I'm going to talk about some specifics in a model here in a minute, but you know, let's say a school building, like maybe the classrooms you want to give individuality to. So, so, you know, it could be a different piece. If this were a school building, maybe this were something like the gym or the theater, something special that you wanted to highlight out, right? So if, if your goal is to highlight something out, then you might make a symmetrical form that clearly reads as a unit attached to something else, right? So, so using symmetry and using asymmetry in your forms can help define wholeness of buildings or individual components of buildings, right? And something else, so that's sort of the first part of this. I hope it's interesting. I hope you could follow that. Second part, very similar, but also using edges and edge conditions and forms can also help read as holes and and pieces. And so there's many times I think where where you do need to make a whole building, one building look like individual pieces. And so using symmetry and edges can really go a long way to doing that. And so um, I think it's most often comes apparent with um, with residential buildings of many different types, not necessarily the single family detached that you see in suburban settings, but let's imagine this was an apartment building, right? And so I tended to do professionally a lot of urban design work. You don't get into a lot of the detail. And if you're modeling a big area, this could be a shape of an apartment building. It's several floors tall, you know, a double loaded corridor down, down the center. Um, but it doesn't really look interesting. It's just, how do I know there's apartment buildings here? It's just a flat wall. I can't really see things. But the thing about residential buildings is individual people live there. It is not like a museum where guests come and go in. I don't care. There's one, one person occupies this or one family maybe occupies this zone, a different one, this zone, a this different one, this zone, a different one down here and so on across. Right. And the, and it's very personal and a building like this, which many modernists did, it's impersonal because you can't say, Hey, that's mine. People want, even if they're renting, they want, a little slice of their own. They want to be able to tell people who are walking down the streets, yes, when you're coming, that's my apartment. Or when they're walking home late at night after work, they want to be able to look and say, ah, I'm home. That's mine. I can see it. I understand it's there. It gives them, it just psychologically gives them the sense of warmth and home. And I think it's, we should respect that. And there's lots of ways of doing that in architecture. So from the first point, you know, one thing I can do is I can add bays. Now, there's lots of good reasons for putting bays on apartment buildings from gaining more square footage and views and light and windows. But I think from for this presentation's point of view, it really starts to break down the facade, um, you know, because because I can say, OK, well, clearly now I, it was really hard to tell before, but now I can pretty be assured that I don't know what the horizontal uh, breaks in the building are yet. But there clearly is a set of units here. There's a different set of units here, and there's different set of units here. Similarly, the same thing happens on the back. So I know there's at least a three-part building. There's three buildings or three apartments across on each side, um, on each and on each floor, and that's clear because there is a bay here. So it starts to break it down. So um, 
that helps a lot. And then similarly, you know, it doesn't just have to be formed. There's no reason why you can, can't highlight edges with materials. Um, I'm just using a line because I'm doing SketchUp, uh, you know, drawing here, but this could be one material, this could be another material. And if you see that line, now you know that that reinforces what the bay is. I could also put lines of materials we see in older buildings that you see the floor line coming through at these levels. Now you break it up. If the floor were coming through, like concrete outside the, uh, the facade material, whatever the case might be, now I know, oh, there's a unit here, a unit here, and a unit here. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Maybe this, some, not every apartments exist on the first floor. They might be retail, they might be things like laundromats and things like that. But certainly up here, there's three on each level. The same would happen on the back. And it's clear. And if I were walking in the street, I would know exactly what mine is. Just by developing a little bit of form and a little bit of material work, I can have that figured out. Um, of course, it would add to the urbanism as well. It would make anyone feel more comfortable walking down the street. So that's sort of how you could use these ideas in an apartment building. Um, the same is true with like row houses. I love row houses. Um, for a variety of reasons. You might call row houses townhouses or brownstones or something like that. But basically, row houses are individual homes. It's just that their homes are touching each other. Your sidewalls are touching each other. This is meant to be, again, quickly, it's sort of the bad design concept without using any Gestalt principles. Um, you know, a set of row houses, it's five. I don't remember how many I put here. We'll see here in a second. Um, but there's it's several. It doesn't read that way, right? This is a design that says, I don't care how people actually see things. If I say it's five homes, it's five homes. You know, get over it. And, and people have designed this way in the past. When I've seen bad row houses, they look like this. It's impossible to tell where one row house ends and one begins. And uh, people don't like that, and it doesn't. So it doesn't make for a good home. So how how can we address this again? This is so simple. Uh, but one thing I can do is highlight the edges, just like before. Uh, on the apartment building. And I've seen row houses with the difference only being downspouts. Imagine this is a downspout. I could have gotten a picture and I didn't, but imagine this is that. This is a downspout. That alone makes this a better design because people say, oh, there's actually four row houses here. Right? And you understand, this is my row house. That's my neighbor's row house. Super important. So adding edges, reinforcing those edges could be done with materials. It could be done, like I said, a simple downspout. Obviously, it can be done more sophisticated than that as well. But that is really important. And then we can, we can sort of take off those lines, those edges. And I can also just do something, again, super about as I tried to do it as simple as I could, could think of it for this demonstration. I was like, what could make you use sort of good form and symmetry to be able to see four units here? It's a lot like what we were looking at at the beginning of this presentation, if I hold it here and I said, you know, this is four parts, could you draw four parts or could you see it? And everyone will say, yes, I see the four parts and they would add a dividing line there, they would add a dividing line there and they would add it there. And that's just because we read this as a unit. We see this as a symmetrical whole. And, we, and because it bumps up, we then read this as it's sort of separate symmetrical whole and read this one and this one and so on and so forth. I did it with heights here. If I added something like bays, if I really made this row house that had bays, it had a porch uh, and things of that nature and use that as part of the rhythm and symmetry and I use symmetry and rhythm in the, each of these, then it would become pretty clear. Of course, I could combine both those gestalt, symmetry, rhythm and edges all together and really make it clear. And that's what I, I would encourage everyone to do when they're thinking about design. Again, I know this presentation was a little bit different than where much of this class goes, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time showing you what I've been thinking about and how to apply these principles and really sort of, I don't want to say manipulate the way people think of it, but understand that what you draw is going to be interpreted by people's minds subconsciously, and you can use that to your advantage. And many times it's just about dealing with symmetry and asymmetry. So go and have fun with those concepts and keep making great designs and keep making great drawings.